Do you suck at money? Don't worry. You're not alone. That's why Matt and I created this podcast, How to Money. That's right, Joel. Money can be intimidating, and we're all about changing that perception. We're two best friends, making money conversations fun and interesting, and helping people suck a whole lot less at this money thing. So whether you want to save more, buy a home, or just gain a better perspective on a subject that affects all of us, listen and subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for How to Money. The big difference... When he grows up, in fact, if we wanted to wait for the year 2001, is that he will have in his own house, not a computer as big as this, but at least a console through which he can talk to his theater computer and get all the information he needs for his everyday life, like his bank statements, his theater reservations, all the information you need in the course of living in a complex modern society. This will be in a compact form in his own house. He'll have a television screen like this here, and a keyboard, and he'll talk to the computer, get information from it, and he'll take it as much for granted as we take the telephone. That's Arthur C. Clarke in 1974, apparently being interviewed in front of an airplane or something. (laughs) Incredibly loud there. But how spot on was that? A prediction of the future so far down the road that few could have predicted as he did that was so damn accurate. And welcome to episode two of the News Junkie Interviews. Hey, thank you so far for the amazing feedback on these new shows. And don't forget, tell your friends you can subscribe on any podcast platform, iTunes, you know, the Android, uh, Google Play Store, whatever they're calling it today, iHeartRadio, and you can even, of course, listen via the News Junkie app if you get the latest update. That's maybe one of the more convenient ways to do it. And there's more features in the News Junkie app, like a See It Now a feature for these shows where in the future we'll load up some additional content. Speaking of the future, this week brings us to our second big quest, down to the bottom of it, and see what we can learn along the way. It's a show for the intellectually curious. And this week the question is, what? will the future look like on this episode of the news junkie interviews now what will the future look like what will it look like in 2045 or so that is a massive question to try to get down to the bottom of and i'm not just talking about the way we used to view it when we were young right oh flying cars that those jetsons reruns promised us And the little microwaves that made a meal in a moment or just made meals out of, I don't know, atoms or whatever. All of that stuff never really came to fruition. I mean, it's not all that far off, but I'm talking about predicting the future in terms of what's going to happen with education. What's going to happen with world affairs? All right, what will the cars of the future look like? What will everything, all these major facets from the Internet to uh, entertainment and far beyond look like in 2045? So for the big question this week, what will the future look like? I reached out to futurist David Hull. This guy has been on top of things for a really long time. He was one of the people who put together MTV. And you'll hear about a lot of the other stuff he's done. He's always been ahead of the curve. It's amazing to think about 25 years from now, but let's start for just a moment by going 25 years in reverse. I kid you not, this is real. I'm not making this up. This this is real. From 25 years ago, the Today Show broadcast to millions and millions and millions of people across the United States and beyond was discussing the Internet a new phenomenon at the time, and they were perplexed by things like the at symbol. Listen to this. Back now at 56 past, I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's That right. little mark with the A out. Yeah. Oh. See, that's what I said. Mm-hmm. Um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around I'd never heard it about, said. About, I'd about, always about seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. There it is. Violence at NBC. G- they are so oh. perplexed. They have no idea what the at symbol well, even is. Should know. What, what is internet that, anyway? What is internet anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network. Mm-hmm. The one that's becoming really big now. 
What yep. do you mean? That's bad. What, how does one? No, what do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people oh. use it and communicate. It, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? What, is what does it, it mean? Anything in ten seconds or less. Oh. <laughs> oh, Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from. Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's so like a look computer in the billboard. It's, it's not in it. It's, it, it's, it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide, right. and it's, it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger. All the time. It's getting it bigger. It came really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating power. out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie, you know. But you don't, need, you don't need that. You don't need a phone line to operate no. internet? No. 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 They, they had no clue. This was just 25 years ago. Think about the changes since then. So that's why it's so interesting. Let's get into what happens 25 years into the future. As per usual, let's get into what you think and take it to the streets. Here are the latest uh, responses to Coleman's questions. What do you think the world will look like in 25 years? Probably dirty. Probably, uh, I don't know what smell would look like, but I imagine that. I hope that we get a little uh, better about that. But uh, I, I kind of just imagine like fumes and and dirty. What do you think the world will look like in twenty five years? Bunch of fat people, not doing anything because they're all lazy. What is your biggest concern for the future? Um, personally, probably money. All of my family lives until their late nineties. Um, so if I don't start saving now, like. I'm in my mid-30s, so uh, <laughs> I've got a long way to go if, if history is... Uh, that, that's a huge concern. Hopefully um, hopefully it looks great and we don't uh, have any big wars. Physically, though, I think we're going to build, build, build until it looks more like New York or some kind of concrete jungle like L.A. It's going to be a squalor. Uh, it's going to be a cesspool of uh, hepatitis. It's going to be a cesspool of use syringes and also band-aids and uh what in the future are you most excited about um i guess i'm excited about uh oh man i'm thinking really grim here um i don't think i can make any real predictions about anything but i am excited to see where it goes and uh i kind of can't wait um sort of just like in the last 10 years from now how much things have changed or whatever yeah. i kind of judge it almost like a you know, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. I am curious to see what uh, the next few years will look like. I don't, I don't know what it's going to look like, though. All right, that brings us to this week's interview, my conversation with futurist David Houle. It got off to a bit of a rough start, I think you could say. It was almost like technology was fighting for a place in the conversation as his email was fighting him. Oh, wait, let me shut my... I thought I shut it. Hold on. Let me shut this. Uh, I'd closed out my outlook, but it's not shutting down. Hold oh. on. Uh, um, let's make sure it's it's not closing. Hold on. Okay. I, I mean, uh, I have. I mean, I've, <laughs> I literally put into a single file like twenty emails so that I could. Come on, close down. He eventually got it. After that, we got down to work figuring out the answer to this week's big question. So think about it as we go through it. What does the future look like? Here is my wide-ranging conversation with amazing futurist David Hull. Want to ask the question again? Start over? Yeah, yeah, I'll just start over. Okay. So uh, how does one become a futurist? Well, for, for me, it was a lifetime of doing things that people either said wouldn't work or were not possible to do. So just to name a couple of them, in 1980, um, I was the number one sales guy for CBS TV in Chicago mm -hmm. in 1980. And I literally took a 50 percent pay cut to go join, you know, the probably three dozen people at the time that were working on launching MTV. So at that time. Cable was in 10% of the country. Nobody understood what uh, video music was. And, and then we also went on to launch Nickelodeon, um, a channel for kids, of course, and, and um, CNN headline news and did a transponder deal with Ted Turner for CNN. Mm -hmm. So 
all of a sudden I was overseeing sales for all those networks. And people were saying to me, gee, cable's never going to happen. What do you mean video music? <laughs> who's going to watch a 24-hour news channel? What do you mean a channel just for kids? Right? Yeah, I, I remember when my, my parents, uh, when we first got cable, and they were like, a channel that just plays music videos? This is never going to work. <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, and then and then in the 90s, I was the managing director of a, a dot-com 1.0 that uh, was the one of the very first companies creating online courses for colleges. And, of course, that'll never happen. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until this century that I I'd given a, a speech at Berkeley uh, to all the senior people of uh, California higher ed technology, because I'd been speaking about the Mer the merging of technology and education at the time. And I just came back and said, I want to do this, whatever this is. And it was talking about the future. So then um, I just started a blog in 2006, Evolution Shift. And then my Shift Age book came out in early 2008. And then it started. So basically, it was just all my life, I could give you 10 more examples. Where I've done stuff and people said, what are you doing that for? That'll never happen, never work. And then I finally realized, okay, my highest value to the planet, you know, to people, companies, governments, markets, is to talk about the future, be accurate about it, and and then facilitate a conversation about it. One of the things I like that you do is on your website, and everybody can check it out, it's, it's davidhool.com, but it's D-A-V-I-D-H-O-U-L-E.com. I don't think a lot of people do this. Maybe you could tell me, maybe you're the only one. You actually put up what your predictions are were and then you go back and kind of score yourself as time passes like hey i said in 10 years this was going to happen i said this was going to happen and i got these ones right but i got you know this one was a little bit off and it's going to change in the future uh, are, you, are you the only one that actually does that it kind of keeps score i think i am i don't know any other futures that does that i have to say one caveat to your listeners which is um, I'm busy writing books, and so <laughs> I've made a lot of forecasts. I just need to get my uh, designer guy to put them up because you know, it's a dynamic web web page where you can click on any date. And yeah, I mean, here's here's the thing. I I started out ending up speaking to groups of CEOs. There's a company called Vistage, which is the world's largest CEO group. So 2008, 2009, 2010, and you know what was going on in the world that time it was a great recession, and I became known as the CEO's futurist because I was, I, I, this is something I am very proud of is that I'm very accurate 18 months to five years out mm -hmm. in specifics. And from five years to 10 years, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. And 10 years on it's directional. So for example, if I've made a bad forecast, it's either in terms of degree or timing, but directionally correct. So for example, I think, you know, up there, I don't know, it was 2013, 2014, I made some forecast that within the next two years, 10% of cable subscribers would cut the cord to cable. And I was wrong because it was only 8.5%. Right. right. So, so it's that type of thing. And I've been saying for two years that this year there would be a severe economic disruption and the market, stock market, would turn into a bear market. Now, I'm only going to be off if it doesn't happen by the end of this year, it'll happen early next, next year. So yes, I take great pride in that. And, and, you know, why shouldn't I, I mean, there's so many people out there calling themselves futurists that just talk about the la da stuff of, Oh, it's going to be cool new technology, uh -huh. but you know, why should they, why should anybody listen to them? Yeah. Right? You know, I, were, I, I wonder, uh, being a futurist, I guess there's some, some trouble spots you could get yourself into. Like I, I remember a famous clip from the today show, where they had somebody like a tech expert or, or a few, perhaps even a futurist who went on and they were talking about the internet when it was first starting to become a thing. And they were like, this is never going to be anything. This internet thing, <laughs> it's a fad. It'll never catch on. And then you go, Oh, that one hurts. If, have you ever uh, put your, your neck out there a little bit on a prediction about what things were going to look like five, 10, 15 years down the road and just swing and a miss? No. Um, what I will say is what I missed. I didn't, I was talking, you know, uh, back in the late nineties and when I was talking to educators and technology, I was saying, you know, that we're moving towards handheld computers and we're going to have handheld computers that are also communications devices. So I definitely got that right, but I totally missed the app phenomenon. It wasn't mm -hmm. even in my mind. I mean, y y you know, uh, jobs came up with that and, and, uh, 
you know, when it happened, it was just like, oh, how did I not see this? But it was a whole. So that was one big thing that I missed. Well, that, that's that, interesting because sometimes you get it right, but you didn't get it right. And I'll, I'll explain. So uh, I remember hearing about some futurists who made predictions in the early 1900s about what things were going to look like. And, and uh, uh, they thought that it was going to be. Um, like pneumatic tubes where you'd be able to send, like like you do at the bank, you know, when you put your money in the bank and it shoots the money through to the teller, they thought you'd be able to send almost instantly letters to anybody around the country or even around the world through those pneumatic tubes. And you might go, oh, what a bunch of idiots, they got this wrong. Well, not really. You know, they, they, kind, they got the idea that you'd be able to instantly send a letter or information to somebody, but they didn't have... The knowledge the right about yeah, yeah 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 they didn't have the information about the computer boom that was to come and and so they were wrong but they were kind of right in as much as email is is you if you work around with it a little bit similar to that exactly right yeah exactly so, right and so, so yeah so it, so yeah I I am very proud of making forecasts I mean the first one I made so it's like you know I'm I'm sitting here thinking when I'm when I'm writing my blog. And and uh, it's 2005, 2006, and I'm starting to speak. And 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 uh, a guy said to me, so what forecasts have you made that have been accurate? And I realized, oh, I got to make forecasts. That's right. Mm -hmm. So so in 2006, I wrote when oil was fifty dollars a barrel, <clears throat> I wrote that in two years it would be one hundred and twenty five dollars a barrel. And I was on a syndicated business show and I was the futurist who was saying it would be one hundred twenty five dollars in two years and the gold i think it was goldman sachs or some such you know, well that's not going to happen let's listen to the financial analyst <laughs> and, he, and he says 55 to 60 and of course it went to 147 so that put me on um and um it's followed since then uh, so For some, yeah go ahead so uh, a couple of things before we kind of dig sure. deep here one thing i want to say is i know that to you this is an interesting spot in an important spot being a futurist because you you see climate change as a fork in the road where look it doesn't matter uh, uh, as you see it, it what's going to happen with vehicles or with education or with technology because if we don't focus on this it it'll it'll stop all that from happening and i do want to get into that in in your book moving to a finite earth economy uh, which sure. is part of a series in just a little bit but to to lay the groundwork here um the way i see it and please tell me if i have this even close to right is if you want to try to see where trends are going in two years or four or five years or even maybe 10 years, you can start to try to predict those things by watching what's happening in any industry. The problem is when you try to predict things that happen maybe 25, 50, or even 100 years out, there's so much room for error, and that error then compounds over time and then you could end up really, really far off the mark. Is that what makes those longer term predictions so much more difficult to really hone in on? Uh, for me, they're not difficult. Um, and, and I'll explain why. Um, when I speak to groups of CEOs and I ask them the questions, so what excites them or worries them about the future? Almost all of them to a person say, answer that question through the lens of their business. Well, I'm not sure whether I should move my manufacturing to China, or I'm not sure about the future of so-and-so, or I'm not sure about, you know, staffing up or whatever it is. And I say to them, so you're looking to the future through the lens of your business. I'm looking outside in to trends that will affect your business that you can't see because you're so in your business. So they're in verticals. Like I, you know, speak to oil and gas people. And I speak to, to medical and, and educational and, 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 environmental mm -hmm. and they're all in their silos so they see through them and my job is just to skip from the top of silo to silo so i you know i always when people say how do you do your research one of the things i say is i'm the most superficial intellectual grazer you will ever meet <laughs> right because i got 300 so incoming newsletters every day and i don't read them all but i scan them so my job if i stay away I think there's a popular phrase, pay attention to the signal, not the noise. Yeah. And most people pay attention to the noise. So, so, and if you're in your business, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, and, 
And so by, by being very high level, one of the things I say that I think is, it, it, it sounds kind of dumb. I may be dumbing myself down by saying this, but one of the things I do is I oversimplify things to give people aha moments. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really what I do because the truth is, you know, I'm working on a book called the truth is simple and the future is clear. Mm -hmm. And, and it is, we just like to complicate things. I mean, if you, and, and so I try to stay away from the details. I operate at the highest level I possibly can. And when you do that, you don't get caught up in opinion, point of view, specific knowledge, you're staying at trends. The second thing I do uh, is that the future flows from the present, always does. So what I do is I'm a very much of a short and long-term historian. I look back to what's ascending, say over the last 20 years into this now moment and what's descending into this now moment and then just project it forward. So I'm as much, I really rely on history a whole lot because it, it, it tells me it not just, if you don't pay attention to history, you repeat it, but it's much more close in like the, 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 the explosive growth of, of, um, cell phones and then smartphones was easy to predict. And I predicted it right on, we're going to get to this billionth and this billionth just because I was looking backwards into now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I want to, wanted to ask you and, and, uh, I wanted to get this out sort of at the beginning because I sure. think, um, it's, it's kind of in a weird way important. I I've always of the frame of mind that this is a really, really interesting time to be alive. And when I go back through as a student of history, uh, you know, the progress made in the uh, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, you go through that timeline and there wasn't this rapid progress that we have been seeing in the last hundred years or so. And it's amazing to see things not only change dramatically, but change dramatically at an incredible pace. The first question I have based on that is, number one, do you think this is a super interesting time to be alive? And number two, do you think that's something that everybody at all these previous times probably thought as well? Answer to number one, absolutely. It's the, uh, the period, and this is what I've been speaking about, the, the period 2017 to 2037. That 20-year period will have more change than any other 50-year period in history. And if you're an aging baby boomer, as I am, you know, last year, 2018 was all about the 50th anniversary of 1968. So we relived it. So think about that. Between now and 2037, there'll be more change than there has been since 1968. Yeah. So the second. Yeah, I mean, when you when you consider that things like YouTube, which are game changers, I mean, just totally. platforms that change everything. YouTube only came around in 2005. Right. I mean, these th these things are not the, all the stuff that's happened in the 20th century so far. It's it's flying by, and and there are major, just earth shattering changes that are happening right in front of our eyes. Absolutely. And and the difference is the is you know when I wrote my first book, The Shift Age, came out in 2007. I said the speed of change has always been accelerating through history but it's been like an accelerating accelerating linear line right mm -hmm. it picks up speed in the shift age which is what i'm known for roughly starting 2005 um the speed of change is has accelerated so much that we now it's it's environmental we live in an environment of change in other words it everything is changing at once that's what that's what's causing so much psychological disruption. Yeah. Healthcare's changing, education's changing, communications changing, transportation's changing, energy's changing, uh, breakthroughs in medical science is changing. Everything is changing. Whereas, you know, if you if you go back to say America in 1800, it was completely agricultural, and then the Civil War. The way I look at the Civil War was the industrial North beat the agricultural South. Mm -hmm. So over that 60 year period, the North became industrialized. The South didn't. But, and then after that, then the all United States became industrial by their early 20th century. But that was 125 years of significant fundamental change. But that amount of change 
is going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. So that's so su- that, that's super the, interesting. Yeah, when, when 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 you consider this the this shift age that you're talking about where there's actually so much change going on that it's almost fluid, it's happening around us in real time. Do you think and I, I kind of uh, heard you hinting at it perhaps there for a second that maybe maybe the human brain hasn't evolved to deal with this level of change since we're just o- over the years have not evolved to keep up with a pace like this? I am so glad you asked that question. The answer is absolutely true. And so uh, what people call artificial intelligence, um, it, I call it technological intelligence, and I can explain that if you want, but basically we humans have created a technology, technological intelligence, that is self-learning, is becoming creative, intuitive. So right at the time that everything is speeding up, the pop, the explosion of data is beyond, expon- it is exponential. So right at the time that we're having so much overload, we've created a technology that can handle a lot of what we're currently doing. Yeah, yeah, like we're we're maxing out some of our potential or something and creating the thing that that can go exponentially further than us. Isn't that kind of scary though? Well, I don't know. I mean, it, I, as a futurist, I'm a vision-driven guy. So I you know, I live a deja vu life. Something happens, I go, well, I knew that was going to happen, right? So that's the only downside to it. But people don't like change. And you know what I what I what I what I say, Sean, when I before every speech, particularly if it's a big audience, I'll say the one first thing I'd like to ask you to do is to suspend what you think reality is, because your reality is based on everything that you've learned or come to know in your lifetime, mm-hmm. plus what was passed on by your parents. So one and a half lifetimes. If you don't suspend that, you won't be able to hear what the new reality is going to be because you'll keep being in resistance to it. But that's not the way it is. So I literally have to say that because you can't really see ahead if this is the way it is. All right. Well, let's right? let's try to have everybody lift that veil a little bit. And right. and and before we get into the the climate change side of this, let's try to just look down sure. down the road a little bit. And what do you think some of the big changes, some of the major changes we'll see maybe in the next uh, two years or so? Two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Or do you want to go further out than that? Should we start at like five years? I, yeah, I, I, I would like, I, I think it's, two years is difficult because um, one of the things I say is that politicians and governments is what's holding back human evolution. That's, yeah, it's very true. And so, so a lot of what's going to happen next two years is based on politics and government. It, it, clearly in our country, but you look around the world and, and so... I'd rather look at it a little further. All right, let's go. Let's go five years down the road. What What are these the things that you see that are going to be changing, and and what what are things going to look like in terms of just the the modern world? Then, okay, so twenty twenty five, and then twenty twenty five to thirty twenty thirty. Um, it's always been said that electricity is the number one invention, modern invention of mankind. If you think of anything else, it probably needs electricity to run, right? Yeah. And electricity has also changed how humans live on this planet more than any single other invention. In other words, electricity, though it was initially a light bulb, ended up air conditioning, you know, uh, the sun belt, creating sure. a microwave oven, all that stuff. That sure. couldn't be seen. Right? You can imagine how many lives that, that saved. Exactly. Mm. And, and, and you you know, it's hard to imagine that 125 years ago, a lot of people in the United States, a lot of people in Florida didn't have electricity, you know? Yeah. So uh, the point I'm making with that is that what is known as artificial intelligence, and I call it technological intelligence, and I'd like to explain that in a minute, is is going to affect how humans live on this planet as much as electricity. In other words, it's going to create... Uh, one of the things I try to do is to get people to wake up, right? Yeah. In other words, 50% of the jobs, according to a 2013 Oxford University study, from the viewpoint of 2013, in the United States will be gone by 2030 because of technological intelligence. And, it, and what we right now would do is, oh, my God, how do we deal with 50% unemployment, which is what the media is largely doing? Instead, we have to say, 
well, wait a minute. If we can offload 50% of the jobs to technology that can just doesn't mind doing the same thing over and over, 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 over again, ad infinitum, then we've unleashed the greatest amount of human potential in human history. So that's how we have to face it. So I think technological intelligence is one. Another one is going to be the huge transformation driven by climate change and everything else on the energy landscape. Energy is 20% of the global GDP. So between now and 2025, there's going to be massive disruption in the 20% of the global GDP that's energy. Transportation is 19% of the global GDP. And when you think about you know, how electric cars and, and autonomous vehicles and all that stuff. So it's gonna be 40% of the GDP, global GDP is gonna be disrupted to some significant degree. The next thing, and this is the downer, is that right now we have $270 trillion of debt in the global economy, which is basically 3.3 times the global GDP, which is around 80 to 85 trillion. And I've never found anybody who can answer the question, how are we going to retire that, right? So mm -hmm. I forecast that unless something significant happens, and again, politicians and governments are holding us back, I think that uh, there's going to be a debt collapse in the mid-2020s, and it's going to be of a sort that we haven't faced before. And I call it the great debt reset. A couple of great macroeconomists uh, are calling it the great reset. And there's already thinking at the high level going on as to how do we deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, finally, I would say that between that longevity is going to increase, health is going to increase. Uh, to put it this way, the first person to live to be 150 years old is alive today. The second thing to say that's a that's almost a, an axiom, is that technological change today is the slowest it will be in the lifetime of your listeners. Yeah. So those two things, in other words, technology is going to speed up, life expectancy is going to extend, there's going to be a, a debt event of a, of a global sort we're going to have to deal with, and uh 50% of the people may not be working who have jobs today. So how do we deal with that? So now yeah. for, forgive me if this is, is sort of cloudy thinking, but walk with me here. Sure. Um, when, when I'm looking forward and I'm hearing some of the things you're saying and you're talking about people, uh, somebody alive now being the, the first person to live until they're 150 years old and, and all of these things sort of start to, to crush together for me. And does everything become technology in a way? Because the advances in healthcare, I think, that would give us that kind of longevity, so much of that seems to be almost closer to technology than traditional healthcare as we see it. Does, does everything, as we go further and further into the future, sort of morph into technology more than it is what it's traditionally been? Absolutely. You know, I'm really enjoying this interview. That's one of the most insightful questions I've been asked. And the answer is absolutely yes. So starting at the highest level to answer it, um, but uh, from 18, 1859, Charles Darwin published Origin of the Species and Changed the World with Evolution. And he said at the time that the 5,000 years before that, there was an, a, an acceleration in evolution because of the invention of civilization, commerce, law, language. Biologists have said that we, humanity, have involved as much in the 160 years since he wrote that book as that 5,000 years. We're 15% bigger, 15% heavier, bigger brains. I think that the merger of humanity and technological intelligence between now and 2050 will be a slingshot evolutionary leap whereby humanity merges with technology, offloads everything that humanity doesn't absolutely have to do to technology, have technology be much more, much faster, more efficient, more reliable to free us up so that, so that that is what's going to happen. Um, so sort of uh, an, another rapid Darwinian evolution that, that springboards us ahead. I, I, that's what I see, you know, 
in a 30 year big arc of the history of humanity. Well, the, right. the, the thing is a lot of stuff that I've read personally, the things that I've looked into that always show that the human brain is, is robust and it, it is malleable and, and it can, it can adapt to things rather quickly when it needs to. Uh, like, I, I guess an example I could give you, if somebody loses a sense, you know, they very quickly start relying on their other senses more. Your vision is taken away from you for some reason. Your hearing becomes sharper. Your hearing is taken away from you. You rely on something else, and you quickly just, you know, sort of adapt to work in, in your new scenario. And if all of this stuff is happening so fast, then the technology around us is changing everything at, at a monthly, if not weekly, pace sometimes – the brain has to keep up. Do, do you, are you that same opinion that you think the brain will be able to keep up with this high rate of evolution? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the more that we can offload of the repetitive functions that we do, the more we can, div the more we can free our brain for the stuff that's truly challenging. Um, and, you know, I, <laughs> I very jokingly say, you know, in 15, 20 years, you know, I walk up to somebody in the audience, I'll go, hello, my name's David, and they'll say their name. And I say to the audience, what's the next question I might ask? And the audience says, what do you do? And I say, you know, that question may not be asked in 15 or 20 years by, to a significant point, because for the first time in human history, we may not be defining ourselves by where we fit in the economic machine. So this this is another interesting road to maybe wander down for a second here. Sure. Uh, let let's give an example when when it comes to um, technology and an industry merging and becoming sort of one and the same. One that's been brought up a lot in the last several years is the impact that the technological innovations will have on trucking and trucking uh, over the road trucking employs a lot of people in this in this country right. in the United States of America and. If there is more of a movement toward automation, which seems to be the case, barring political intervention, then those jobs are going to at some point dry up. And that could happen at a faster pace than, than a lot of people might think. So you're suggesting that as we move forward with all this technological innovation and some jobs are wiped out, for instance, over the road truckers, you don't necessarily have to find another job for that person. We can just replace our work that we've done and our labor that we've done with digital labor that provides for everybody, or am I way off the mark there? Well, um, the two things to say is, again, you have to suspend reality as it exists. You and I have lived in a country and in a world that has been defined since World War Two, you know, get a job, buy a, you know, buy a house, get a car, get a second car. The whole thing about post World War Two tax code and policy, okay, is where we are, and that has to change to be enable for a lot of things to happen. In other words, um, uh, we we'll have to allow. You have to do something called a universal basic income or something like that, okay. where everybody gets a basic income. That that needs a complete retrofitting of tax policy and social policy and everything else. The second thing to say, though, is that going forward, the the most important thing for the state or the government to do is to be responsible for educating and retraining the populace. In other words you know, go back to the 2016 election and coal is good and coal is bad. Well, coal is going away. So you don't just say we got to, you don't go into West Virginia or Kentucky and say, sorry, coal is bad. What you go into is you go into and say, look, for all of you coal miners who have a short lifespan because you work in coal, um, here is a multi-million dollar uh, training to retrain you to install solar panels, mm -hmm. right? So you don't just, you know, a compassionate, forward-thinking government will say we need to retrain. And and uh, you know, education is lifetime learning. When I graduated from college as a baby boomer, um, the commencement speakers said, "Oh, you're going to have more than one job in a lifetime," because my father had one job his whole entire lifetime, right? 
Um, now graduates are being told you're going to have three to five careers in your lifetime, two or three of which have yet to be invented. Uh. So the, the only way forward in a speed of change is to have constant lifelong learning. So, so how we do that and systematically employ that and retrain and redo the tax code. I mean, that's, that's, that's why it's so overwhelming because all of this is going to go down in the next decade. And, and let's head a little bit further down the road of, sure. of, uh, of power, of, of you know, how we keep everything operating. I, I, I'm in agreement with you. I think that fossil fuels, like I, I saw a study one time and they were talking about uh, referring to gasoline, I, I think they, they were talking about. And they said, if you call it uh, gasoline, it's rated a, you know, around this, not a very popular word. If you call it gas, people look at it. A little bit better. If you call it fossil fuels, it's like a really, really low rating that's got a, a negative connotation with fossil fuels. And that may be a symptom of something much larger going on where people are kind of turned off by that. And it, it's viewed as a very old school method of, of obtaining energy. So when you peer down that road and you, th- you see different types of energy sources that uh, you think we'll be using in the future, what do you see, number one? Like what types of uh, energy sources? Um, number two, do you think we'll stumble into an energy source that we're just not even aware of right now? And to, to add even one more on, uh, nuclear power, do you think that will be an element of, of uh, any larger term plan down the road? Answer, to get off of fossil fuels as quickly as we need to, which I'm saying in, in this book that I'm publishing by 2030, the only answer relative to what energy is all of the above. Mm-hmm. because Wind and solar are out in front, and they're clean, and they're renewable, and the problems are being solved with them. Uh, but uh, they can't scale enough by 2030. So you're going to have to take hydro in, and you're going to have to take, to, to combine your question one and three, you're going to have to take nuclear. Because every time a nuclear plant, plant closes, carbon dioxide goes up because it has to be replaced. Mm-hmm. And and again, this is the past reality and the future reality. Most of the uh, gen, uh, the the nuclear generation plants are second generation in the United States, and we're talking. Um, and I'm writing about this right now. This chapter in technology, it's going to be published in a couple weeks. Is is that Gen four uh, is coming? Hopefully by 2030, they say. And I'm trying to hope persuade them to do it earlier. Um, which are small trash can size reactors. So like I live in a housing community of about 103 homes. Mm -hmm. I think it's that one nuclear power plant, one trash can reactor with no um, uh, contamination can power this community, right? So it becomes distributed. So I think all of the above, I think that in answer to your question, is there a new one? Well, we have to assume that there is. Um, you know, whether fusion ever takes root or not. One of the things that I've been a proponent of for, for uh, I was introduced to 12 years ago at a, at a foundation for the future energy 3000 conference was space solar power, where just the image is a 40 mile square uh, solar panel in geosynchronous orbit above the earth, have a dozen of them, or maybe even less. I'm working on that now, maybe six to 12 of them can power the whole planet. Why is that significant? Because you have a solar panel above the atmosphere. So you have intense sunlight. Mm-hmm. You're, ab- you're above the clouds. So it's, it's not variable energy and it's, and it can, it, it can power, it can power the world for as long as there's the sun and the sun is p- projected to be around for 3 billion years. So that's solar power, which we know, but it's up in space. So it's these made. So we're at this point where, and this is what concerns me, is is and what I'm trying to provoke with these 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 books that I'm writing, which is which is we have to redo everything. We have to redo the fundamental economy. We have to redo how we think about things. And until we we do that and come up with, with transition into the other big model that will hopefully carry on for millennia, is it's just all of the above until we get there. All right, that's that's what energy looks like. What does tech look like to you as we head down the road? Does does tech change radically? Because uh, let's just let's just take this in a really simplistic way. Everybody's got a smartphone, right? Right. Um, those smartphones they can only get so thin, they can only get so big or so small, and 
smartphones, do they then go somewhere else? Does that become part of something you wear, something that's in- internal? What what goes on as you see it with tech in the future? Uh, I think we're at the point with tech where some people are going to choose to stay where they are, and tech, but tech goes forward. Like, um, you know, I have an eight uh, iPhone eight plus. Mm-hmm. I don't need to get a nine or a ten or a fifteen because I don't use all the functionality in this phone, right? right. Um, and and the one thing I will say to put it in perspective, I was at Oak Ridge National Laboratories last summer tennessee where the first nuclear fission occurred and they have the fastest supercomputer in the world and they've had that now for nine months usually it goes back and forth between us and china and the guy who was overseeing it told me i have this eight iphone eight plus i have more computing power in an iphone eight plus than the cray supercomputers in the 1970s and 1980s so the point of that is those supercomputers were you know 50 put uh, 200 feet by 200 feet computers Mm -hmm. and I have it in my hand. So miniaturization. So basically the power of the cell of the smartphone you and I have will be a small chip embedded, embedded inside the body if you want. Um, So the technology is going to get always smaller, faster and faster and smaller separately and embedded or external. And so that's where there's a true merging. In other words, what is the definition of life? If somebody has a chip, there are people who are actively working. Memory is just being thought, understood. Mm-hmm. It's been said, sorry, I'm jumping around real fast here, but my mind's racing. It's been said in your my lifetime, every 10 years, we've learned more about the brain in the last 10 years than we knew before. Mm-hmm. That's still continuing, except the time is shortening. So we're really in the golden age of neuroscience where we're mapping how memory works. So the people who are convinced that the solution, for example, to Alzheimer will be implanting a chip that captures your memory and keeps it alive. So so think about that. And there's people who are saying that that we'll be able to to store the equivalent of terabytes of data in a DNA spiral. Mm-hmm. I don't quite understand that, but um so smaller, faster, integrated into the body, more or less depending on who you are and what you do and where you live. Yeah, we're already seeing some some big shifts, like uh, with 5G making yes. its way into the United States. Uh, uh, you know, they're already doing some testing in a couple of marketplaces. And the the way I see it when I think about this stuff is I say, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head with something. At some point we go... Why do I need the new one? Okay, and like you can look at Apple's sales, and and uh, right. th- throughout the early teens, they were they were rocketing up, and in the last couple of years, it's been you know they're 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 still a, a relevant force, and they're still selling a lot of phones, but a lot of those phones are being sold to other uh, sold to other markets and and around the world, the people who are a little bit further behind. But then we start to go, okay, you have this new phone out. But the features are already there. I've already got a brilliant camera. I've already got all of these things. And uh, I don't necessarily feel the urge to, to, to upgrade to the next one until there is a big technological jump that makes me go, now mine feels outdated. Uh, and and the, the biggest thing that I think will shape this kind of stuff, and I wonder if you're on, on board with this, is just everything being in the cloud. With 5G, you don't need to have storage at some point when we go past that like you don't need to have onboard storage on things everything can just be stored in the cloud and accessed you know like that and and it will be just as if it was stored locally on your device well again i thank you for asking making intelligent comments with 5g and you know it's still people don't really have a handle on how fast it's going to be and you know i think verizon's the company saying we're already at 5g that 5g is not the 5g that that you and i are going to be living in yeah. the way i describe it is that you know right now we're talking about smartphones smart doorbells alexa do this so we're going from what was being a, a stupid or a dumb you know, a, a chair is stupid, mm-hmm. uh, but and a door, but and a lock used to be stupid, right? Now they're smart. So what five G is going to do? Everything you just said, it's going to move us to where the intel the environment is intelligence. So we're moving from a dumb environment to a smart environment 
to an intelligent environment. And the way I explain that when I'm speaking to an audience, I'll say, so, you know, in 15 years, this room is going to be smart. So I can say, hey, room, how many people are in the room? Uh And it will know it, right? So to your point, that may, there may just need to be some kind of receiver. The, The only danger, you know, the only danger to this whole connected future that is so brilliant is until we, it, it, uh, up until now, it has been, and it's hard to see how it won't always be hackable. And then for those that have ever seen, that they're listening, ever, that saw, or fans of Blade Runner. Uh-huh, yeah, sure. In, in Blade Runner 2049, the second one, they talked about how the replicants destroyed all the technological files in 2029 because they wanted to cover their trace that they were replicants, right? Mm-hmm. So that made me think, my God, I don't want to have 100% of everything in the cloud yeah. if that would happen, right? <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like all the the things that are most special to you. I mean, I've digital, I have 200 books on my iPhone, right? I've got a um, uh, 100 gigabytes of music on my iPhone, right? Yeah. But but uh, I want to have that backed up somewhere, right? And and uh, so yes, you're right. We're moving into in, an intelligent environment. That's the simplest way to say it. So just a few more things I want to hit on. What what about education uh, looking again down the road and, and whatever uh, length of period of time you want to go? Because I think that's a really interesting place to watch as, as the years go by. Yeah. My context on that is that this decade, 2010 to 2020, I call the transformation decade, change in nature, shape, character, and form. And, and it's also the first decade of 21st century thought. So you know, I've written a book on education. So when I'm speaking to educators, they go, what does 21st century education look like? That's the only thing you have to answer. What does 21st century yeah. healthcare? What is does, is right? there a building? Is there a college? Is there, you know, is, is it the experience that you have now? No. Um, I think, you know, in K through 12, we have to question the school year, the school day, why there are grades. I don't mean ABC grades, but first, second, and third grades. Um, why school is so limited year round. Why everybody based on age is in the same group, mm-hmm. slow learners and fast learners. Um, why when, you know, I persuaded a whole bunch of school superintendents to let um, high school students keep their cell phones on during class because it's, it, all the world's knowledge is just a few keystrokes away. So why would you want to monotone, you know, a baby boomer voice to a bunch of wrestling teenagers, engage them and make it, uh, uh, you know, a, a learning enhancement. So technology is going to profoundly change it. The need that I think the biggest change is we're going to move from thinking that by the time we're 22, we're done educated into lifelong learning. We, we've moved from a knowledge economy society, which was the information age, to a learning economy. We have to always be learning. And that's the only way you can do it, right? So so that's how education is going to change, is completely redefined. I mean, the it, problem it, I have know, with what's David, people, it, it's, interesting, sure. it's interesting that you mentioned the grades thing, because that that's one of those moments, like you said, before you give a speech, you tell these people to sort of unlock their minds a little bit. Right. Be, because you start to pry away and you go, why do we have grades? Not grades as in A, B, C, D, but grades as in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. Well, because we, we group the kids by their ages. Well, do all the kids have an equal footing uh, on an intellectual level at those ages? No. Well, then why do we do this? Well, because we've always done it. Right. You know? Exactly. You know, I mean, in terms of education, when I wrote my book eight years ago, I said, OK, so the school year <clears throat> is based on the agricultural age spring break to help with the planting, um, summer break to help with the harvest. Then we, then we did uh, buildings in the industrial age. That's when you know, the, the, the chairs became in a row, a bell went off and you got up and you moved from one room to another room for called periods. And that was to train people for the factory model. So now that you've graduated from an institutionalized um, bell ringing system, Mm -hmm. you can go work in a factory. Well, and then with the information age, oh, well, we added computers. And now uh, where everything is rapidly changing and careers are changing and coming and going, um, you just can't do it. I mean, I I always use the uh, legacy thinking, like 
you're, if you've ever been in Europe, the roads are narrow, not the super highways, but the old roads. Why uh -huh. are they narrow? Because they're the width of two oxen with a, with a wood yoke huh. as used by the Romans, right? I mean, you know, so the unquestioning carrying forward of the past will not serve humanity in the next 15 that's, years. That's very interesting. You, you could go a mile down that rabbit hole. Uh, right. Uh, let, let's, let's head towards business, commerce, brands, and that kind of stuff. You think brick and mortar is going to be around when, when we look way down the road? Yeah, but not the way it is. <clears throat> I mean, I, I was in 2010, 2011, I started saying there's going to be an apocalypse in physical retail uh, in the United States. And of course, there has been. And the problem is that the physical retailers were looking at one another for competition. They didn't see over here on the screen reality, which is based on digits, something called Amazon.com, right? So, you know, nor did taxi companies see Uber, right? Yeah. So, so current businesses and physical retail and physical shopping is going to continue to decline. It just is. It's, it's not time efficient, customer centric, uh, or viable, uh, long term in terms of growth models. So, uh, that part's going to go away. I think a lot of, you know, I work from home for the last 20 years of my life. I've worked at my home office. I have mm -hmm. a 10 second commute. Why would I spend two hours commuting right. in a day? Right. You know, so, so I think that distributed workplace and distributed education and distributed participation and distributed buying and selling, you know, I think you were moving to ever more platforms and fewer destinations. I, you, you already see, with what you're talking about for work a lot with younger people with with gen z uh or i gen or whatever you'd like to refer to them as you see these people uh who are getting jobs and going into the workforce and they start to question things just like the norms that we were talking about moments ago with grades and stuff the, these younger folks are going well why do i have to drive to this building to get this work done you, you don't <laughs> right. only, you don't right. only have internet access in that building I, you know, I'm not sitting behind a machine making widgets where I have to be here. Why can't I uh, work from, from home X number of days a week? There's, there's a monumental shift in worker expectation from the flexibility of management as to uh, where they can work from and when they can work. I, I see that happening. And, um, and I wonder, is that, is that a product of just a younger generation or – you know, they more digitally connected. Why, why do you think that shift happens? Well, uh, I don't call them the Gen Z. You know, the Gen X was the right name. Mm -hmm. And then it was Gen Y and Gen Z. I call them the millennials and the digital natives. Because yeah. what are you going to do? Go through the alphabet again? Go, <laughs> a, a, a. I mean, I just never understand. Where, where, where do you go after Gen Z, right? So yeah. I call them the digital natives. They're starting in 1998 birth year. They're the first generation to be born in the digital landscape. Sure. I mean, unless, and I don't know how old you are, but... But most uh, Gen Xers on up through baby boomers became digital immigrants when they were adults. Yeah. Right. I didn't grow up with I didn't grow up with a computer. I didn't grow up with a fax machine. I didn't grow up with a cell phone. Right. So so the point is, if you've grown up with it this way, you're in direct. Curious confrontation with those that grew up with other technologies. Right. So back about 10 years ago, this issue you just mentioned, I started dealing with. When people say, well, I need everybody to come into work so I can see that they're working. And I say, how can you look at somebody and tell they're being productive? <laughs> well, if they're at their desk, you know. And I, and I said, well, figure that out. I mean, if you let a single mom spend Monday and Friday uh, working from home and let her get her all her work done so she can be home Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday when a kid comes home, she will be much more productive and grateful than making her have to pay for daycare and show up so you can see her. You know, I mean, but as recently as 10 years ago, there were people who who felt that the only way they could manage is by looking at people. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so that comes from the, you know, again, put it in a bigger framework. Modern humanity has been around for 150,000 years. And only in the last 150 with the telegraph have we been able to communicate without being face to face. So one one ten thousandths of the time that we've been on this planet in our current evolved state, have we been able to communicate without being face to face? So it's a long history that has to be overcome. 
and we have to, and it it's the digital natives and the millennials i see it as a generational shift the millennials are taking us part way the digital natives are bringing us home and you talk to any millennial say somebody who's 20 and has a 10 year old brother or sister mm -hmm. they won't stop telling you about how different their younger brother and sister is so you know these new folks right i mean how how could you explain to somebody who's been able to i mean just I, just think about the cell phone. How many? There isn't a day that goes by that I don't search for something. I'm mm -hmm. in a dinner conversation. Is so and so still alive? Well, let's look it up, right? I mean, it, it, when when it when information is instantaneously available wherever you are, why do you have to be anywhere at all? Yeah, I mean, it, it kills bar arguments a little bit. When uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's this. I think well, you no longer have to wait to go back to. To dive into a book or something just instantaneously, the answer right. is at your fingertips. Yeah. So right. what so, what yeah. about what about brands in in general? I, I think well, um, you know, I wrote a book called Brand Shift: The Future Brand to Marketing uh, that was named the best uh, one of the best marketing five best marketing books in the world, twenty fourteen. Sorry to beat my chest on that. No, get, do it. You know, I haven't been involved in launching MTV and Nickelodeon and CNN. You know, I. I Brands are more important than the product, but brands are going to change to, uh, as I wrote in that book, they're going to have to be multi-tiered. In other words, Coca-Cola is different at age 10 than it is at age 60, or Nike is different, or even IBM is different, whatever, right? So the point is that you have to have multiple points different brands to address different segments. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about we all become tribes. Well, what is our brand for this tribe? What is our brand for that tribe? And then you have to be uh, much more in support of the person's identity. Like, for example, Red Bull commercial, if it's a 30 second TV commercial, they don't show the, the brand until the last five seconds. They don't show the can of Red Bull. They show some guys in squirrel suits flying around clips. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Right? So the point being, if you're if you're a if you're a X Games guy, if you're a skateboarder, this is the brand for you. So you you don't go into sell, sell, sell and buy, buy, buy. And also sales don't work anymore because when is something not on sale? Right? Yeah. So when somebody says now on sale, it's kind of go well, it always will be not with you with somebody else. So I don't have to respond. You don't have to trick me into buying something or 70% off. Well, you're still spending 30% more than you would have spent if you didn't buy it. Right. So, so all of, so all of the old marketing has to change to be much more customer centric rather than customer dictatorial, if that's the right word. Do you think classic brands stick through that? Depends how they adapt. So, like, will right now we have some legacy brands? Like Coca Cola is a good one, and and Coca Cola seems to survive across generations, and it's one of those things that people can look back on, and you're like, yeah, you know, I I like this deal, even though it's not the state of the art most relevant thing, it still works in the marketplace. Or Budweiser as a beer, you know, you have those brands that kind of transcend generations. Do you think that things start to move so rapidly? that there's just no worry or care for anything that has any sort of legacy power as far as brands go? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> well, relative to Coke, for example, 20 years ago, they didn't spend a cent on marketing water. Now they're spending a significant their budget on marketing water that they just you know, take from the tap, rebottle sure. and sell at a high price, right? Right, right? But why are they doing that? Because of all the health that we know about diabetes and, and all of that. So they're adapting, but they're never going to adapt a sugar. I mean, I think sugar, co sugar colas are, have been declining for years and will continue to decline. That's a, that's a larger issue. That's a, that's the dying part of a brand. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but they're, again, it's how they morph. Um, but you take Nike, they're morphing well. And again, um, it, it's how the audience is changing. Health wasn't an issue 20 years ago the way it is now. Now it is now um, it's a major issue. Organic had maybe one tenth of one percent of the United States population even knowing what it was, right? And and so so brand, so new brands will embrace new things that rise up, and old brands will decline if they don't embrace it. But, you know, I've, I've spoke to a number of 
business people go, you know, we've been around since 1895 or we've been around since 1913. And I kind of go, so why should I buy from you today? <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. You know, I mean, that that kind of legacy is useless now. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Ask telling a 15 year old, well, this is a company that's been around for 100 years. You know, they don't care. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, just a couple more things here before we get into the, the climate change side of, of things. Sure. Um, I know you focus a lot on health care. Is, is that yes. going to be an area, area of, of massive change in the future? Yes. Um, to oversimplify it, the, the big three of health care is going to be big data, technological intelligence, and DNA. DNA, because we've cracked the code, so now we can treat patients as individuals rather than cancer as generic. So you could take, um, rather than degrade the whole system if you have cancer with chemotherapy, you just take the appropriate cancer drug, fit, make it uh, customized to the, a person's DNA, mm -hmm. inject it into the tumor, and the tumor will shrink without degrading the system. That's just an example that's going on now. Technological intelligence, because it's been proven, again, it's I'll explain technology and that artificial because uh, it's been proven time and time again that technological intelligence combined with big data is much better at diagnosis of disease than doctors are. Yeah. Because, a you know, they, they did a study. There was a study done recently, 92 women who ended up having early stage breast cancer. Well, the doctors correctly diagnosed it on the first pass. 46 of them were diagnosed. So about half. Right. Mm -hmm. And and. Uh, uh, technological intelligence diagnosed like um, 72 or something correctly the first time. Why? Because they have access to all the world's data and, and opposed to the doctor who just is one on one with the patient. Yeah. Right. So and, and then and then. Um, uh, the, right. So the combination of high speed computing, technological intelligence with unlimited amounts of connectable data and then the customization with DNA. So. Everything's going to change. That's relative to healthcare and medicine. But the other thing that's going to happen is life extension therapy. I mean, people are going to be living longer, not just living old longer, but, you know, like at age 21, everyone will have to have a preventative checkup where everything's done with your DNA is done. And so every year you go in and, and you match your baseline. So it's totally preventative. I mean, the United States is a you know, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Do you do you think you'll see something in the future where, let's say you're, um, you know, you're born and you you deal with ADHD or you right. ha are somebody who has depression or you suffer from any number of issues that affect a, a large portion of the the populace of the United States? Do you think with the evolution of healthcare, we'll see that erode? Where if you are somebody who's suffering from depression, you go in and then they just you know, do whatever, and then you don't have it yes. anymore. Yes, yes. In fact, some of the neuroscience stuff that's so interesting these days is that they, they, they can map schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So so that means they know how to treat it externally. So think about, I mean, basically the brain, death is when either the heart muscle stops or the brain goes dead, right? Yeah. So assuming, so the brain controls the whole system. And if we can go in and play with the brain like they've showed successfully in doing some, not the old electric shock therapy, but, but certain customized focused on certain parts of the brain, they've eliminated ADHD and they've eliminated schizophrenia. I mean, this is early stage stuff, but if it's early stage stuff that's working now, it means by 2025, it's going to become much more routine. So yes, the immediate treatment um, of, of diseases uh, and the earlier ability to diagnose such diseases and even before that preconception where you can genetically slice out if one of the two parents has say parkinson's you can remove that gene before mm. they conceive right so i mean it's mind blowing it, yeah it, yeah, but that, it blows my mind that I'm a futurist. Right? <laughs> david um what what do you think i, I heard somebody uh, say once uh and to be clear he was a major investor in Uber, but his uh, his thoughts on the future was that personal car ownership was going to fade away and a shared transportation economy for vehicles was 
going to be part of what the future was. Uber, Lyft, this kind of stuff. You don't need to own your own car. Everybody just rides from somebody else. That's confusing to me because then I, I think the price of vehicles would skyrocket. And then, you know, at least somebody has to have these vehicles because they've got to be the drivers to bring these people around. Do you think that's where the future of travel goes or is there something entirely different? Are we Star Trek style just being transported? Um, start with this fact. And it's an indisputable fact. The average American uses their car 4% of the time. 96% of the time they own it. It's mm -hmm. sitting in the garage at work or in the garage at home or in the street depreciating. So, you know, why would you in a business spend a lot of money, probably your second biggest purchase after a home on something you only use 4% of the time? I mean, that's lunacy, right? Yeah. So number one, um, Another fact, uh, the average age to get a first time driver's license in America is at a record high. It's like 19 and a half yeah. years. Yeah, my son's 18, do doesn't have a care in the world about going to get his, his license. Right. So there you have it because, Dad, I'll just Uber. Uh -huh. Right. right. And, yeah. And, 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 and you know, the, the thing is, people tell me, yeah, but you got to send him Uber money. And I say, sure. But if I didn't do that, I'd have to pay insurance and I had to uh, pay exactly. for his car. And, and so it, it, it's not a massive difference. And, uh, even in smaller cities, they're they're able to get around like that now. Yeah. So the, the, that that guy who's invested in Uber is right partially. The other big piece, again going back to the four percent, is driverless cars, autonomous vehicles. Right. So autonomous vehicles can run twenty four hours a day. You know, assuming they're electric, maybe two hours off to charge. You know, an hour each every twelve every twelve hours, and they can always be going. Right. So. So, again, I live in a community of one hundred and three houses and because it's Florida. There's probably somewhere between one hundred and fifty and one hundred and seventy five vehicles, a good number of them pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. So and they're always sitting there. Right. So instead of that, maybe twenty five or thirty vehicles going nonstop 24 hours a day or at least 18 hours a day and having a couple available overnight um, can handle the load. So. The, again, the simplification is I have always been called on to think about what's the 21st century technology for transportation. Is it light rail? Is it this? And the aha moment for me came three years ago when I was doing the initial deep dive into driverless cars. And I realized, no, it's the interstate highway system with half the number of cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, there isn't anybody listening to this conversation, you know, on their radio that's not going to go as they look around in traffic. Well, it would be a lot better if the half these people weren't here, right? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> right? And and that's the odd thing about humans, right? When you're stuck in traffic, you get mad at the traffic. You don't realize that you are traffic as well, uh -huh. right? It's right? everybody else's fault. <laughs> exactly. So I think he's right. And I think, you, you know, the interesting thing is, so it started with zip cars and then Uber and all that. There are now, there is a, most of the major auto companies have announced, so first, we had to buy a car, then you could lease it. That came about in the latter part of the last century, just to keep the production lines going, right? Now you can rent a new car. And there's platforms that are creating, connecting all the used car lots in the world to say for $200 a month, you can drive a used car. Mm -hmm. And there's three limitations. One, you gotta have a driver's license. Two, you gotta have insurance. And three, you gotta give us five days notice when you want to turn it in, pick up another used car, that's $2,400 a year. Yeah. That's, that's much less than the depreciation of any new car. So yeah. it's absolutely moving in that. In, in other words, I have a, I have a, you've heard the phrase peak oil, right? Do you understand yep. the concept? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're in peak auto now. I think the number of automobiles that have been produced up from the beginning of history to now will be the number of, will be half of all the automobiles ever produced. Huh. Either, both because automobiles will go down in number, sales are already declining. And the second thing is, you may be right, there may be some other type of levitation transport or something that, that isn't yet here. And the reason that's not happening again is the government, because you know the uh, FAA is going to limit, there are, drive, there are um, uh, cars that fly, right? Mm -hmm. But they're drone technology, and that's going to be limited by airplane. So it's all going to happen. We just have to let go of the old.
Well, I prepare for the new. It, but but at least we have the highway system, but with half the cars. That's the way you should think about it. Oh, it'd be that'd be fantastic. I'm hoping that one is hundred uh, percent accurate. Uh, right, right. Uh, David uh, Hull is a futurist speaker and thinker, and if you've been listening to this conversation so far, you know that he's got his finger on the pulse with all this stuff. But your your book, it's a series. Uh, the one that's out now and, and, and kicking ass on Amazon is called Moving to a Finite Earth Economy. And this is where these two worlds kind of uh, clash here. Um, and they they clash in such a way that a futurist and somebody who is following what's happening with climate change around the planet, you, you, you say, well, I'm going to predict uh, 15 years down the road. But if you think 15 years down the road... The biggest concern is going to be that everybody's moving all over the place and that things are shifting all around and that life is changing rapidly because of climate change. That upends the whole prediction uh, method. Right. And right. And so uh, I read uh, moving to a finite earth economy is some interesting things about how you think the U.S. economy and I guess a global economy should shift from there. But let, let's let's start here um, before we get into the climate change stuff. I, obviously, it's very clear that what we're looking at now has been part of this whole massive industrial re re uh, revolution that we've seen around the world. And, and in so many ways, that industrial revolution and, and the revolutions that followed with technology and everything else that have caused there to be much more carbon emitted into the atmosphere have also extended our lives. They have saved countless people they have uh, made life better in almost innumerable ways. And now we have this side effect of this. Are you of the frame of mind that it's, it's the Industrial Revolution worth it when it comes to a thing so far and that now we just need to snap into place and figure out this climate change thing? Or do you think we would have been better off going on a different path before? Well, the answer is yes and yes. I mean, uh, the industrial uh, the industrial revolution created where we are today and and the good news of that is you know i show a chart on how good the world is now you know we're much better educated many fewer of us live in poverty but but the amount of wealth that was created has been created in the world since 1900 mm -hmm. is more than all the wealth created in all history before that and that was simply due to the industrial revolution the problem is back at the beginning of, well, not the beginning, but, but uh, in the late 1800s, I mean, Thomas Edison invented the first car and it was an electric car. And the difference was that electricity wasn't as quickly as scalable as John D. Rockefeller could scale up oil. So he, he who won to find the terms in the new age. It's kind of like today, you know, we're kind of stuck with uh, Amazon, Google, and Facebook have defined the terms in their, their monopolies, mm -hmm. right? So how do we deal with that? But we didn't worry about it back then. So, so it, it, how we fuel the industrial revolution is now has caused the problem. But the point is also, um, in 1950, there was 2.5 billion people on the planet. It took 150,000 years to get to 1 billion in the early 1800s. And yet in the last 70 years, we've gone from 2.5 billion to 7.7 .7 billion. That's so crazy. we more than tripled it. So if we, had, if we had 1 billion people on the planet, we could all be chugging along on fuel, on coal and gas, and it wouldn't be a problem. But the fact that we've overpopulated the planet and everybody wants to live like America does because we sold that well last century, then we're, we, we backed into this corner. So the reality is the choice. Do we keep, you know, I, well, I'll end up getting in the book then, but, but basically the industrial age was magnificent. It was the greatest, it was the greatest single achievement in humanity in terms of increasing literacy, increasing medical care, life extension, wealth creation, discovery, uh, you know, before the industrial age, what was there? I mean, that's the interesting thing. A guy named um, Adam Smith, who mm -hmm. is the author the of the capitalism, yeah. he died in 1792. So here's a guy who has defined capitalism as you know it, and he died before he could see the industrial revolution. Right. right? So that's how skewed things are. So to me, it's a function of, well, it was mindless. 
And now we have to be mindful and we have to change as fast as we can. And, and so, yeah, I'm great with the Industrial Revolution. It's just that 50 years ago, I mean, Earth Day is 50 years ago um, next year. And at that point in time, we knew enough to bring about change, but for a number of reasons, depending on your point of view, the vested interest and paying off politicians, and we didn't really care, and humans don't really react to a future threat only to an immediate threat, it didn't happen. So now it's happening. Now climate change is real, and we have to change. So I think the Industrial Revolution and everything that happened was absolutely right, but we let it run on without refining it. So uh, well, I think the, the the interesting way to head from here is when we talk about climate change and, and what to do and, and how this impacts everything that's happening around the world, what's most important? Uh, as, as I always see it, I see the most important thing we can do just in terms of uh, global initiatives is spending money in a smart way that will help the most amount of people. Things like uh, moving to eradicate malaria, um, uh, various other projects that, that, that so many people suffer from each year. And these projects would, for an affordable amount of money for, on a global scale, either eradicate that or, or help these people out to improve their life quality. Is, is it more important that we, we get the best bang for our buck and help out the most people? Or is it more important that all of our ducks be in a row and we handle climate change in particular before tackling those issues separately? Um, money's always an issue, but I, I wouldn't think of it the way you stated the question. I would suggest <clears throat> if you look again at the highest level, the two things that I see that are most threatening humanity and civilization are the unprecedented wealth inequality that exists today and the, the, the relenting, pounding, ever-increasing danger of climate change. And to deal with both of those, you have to redo the economic fundamentals of the entire global economy. In other words, um, hedge fund guys are saying capitalism is not working because uh, of wealth inequality. And climate change and scientists are saying uh, we have to change laws and policies because we're not going to survive this century if we don't. Right. So so it comes back to, OK, the industrial age was good. The information was good. Now we need a whole new set of fundamental at the core changes, you know, band-aiding it won't work. Throwing money at the old model will not work. You can. Uh, the, the money should be thrown to the new model. As Socrates said, and I quote it all the time, if you want to make a change, don't fight the old, spend your energy on creating the new, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's what we need to do. And, and, you know, not to get into wealth equality too much, but if you look at it around the world, you see this rise of populism and nationalism is, is the way the press, underlying it is a feeling of insecurity that, the present isn't like the past, or these people aren't like the people I grew up with. But more fundamentally is a feeling that that I've lost, the, the society's lost my way. In other words, after World War II, United States for decades was the number one country relative to upward mobility. It is now 57th or something. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're born in the bottom quintile, the percentage will rise above it is, is much less than 57 other countries, right? Yeah. So, so that leads to people being angry and electing somebody like Donald Trump, or that leads to demonstrations in, in France. And, you know, so, so um, those are the two things that show that, uh, what would be the right metaphor? I don't want to say the apple is rotten, that the system is antiquated for the present reality and needs to change. Well, let me let me tell you where I'm coming from on climate sure. change and then you can sure. you, you can tell sure. me where, where I have it wrong or what your thoughts are. Uh, when I think about climate change, I think uh, one of the one of the things I regret most is that climate change of all things has become politicized. I, I think that's a terrible thing. I think there's a wide variety of reasons for that. But that, that's neither here nor there. I think that the idea that it has become 
easy to identify what you believe in terms of climate change, whether you believe it's a clear and present danger or whether you believe it's some sort of you know, global takeover conspiracy and it's, it's so wildly overhyped, can now be very, very easily with a high rate of success pinned to what political party you vote for. Um, I've, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I've never met a Democratic climate change denier. Right, right. You, 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 you can, they directly line up with your, right. your, your, your partisan affiliations. And you see, uh, the, the, I do take issue. I see, though, there are people who are among the maybe most progressive of these who are politically minded in the way they tackle climate change that I think are far too doom and gloom about a situation. I'll tell you one thing that bothers me when I see little kids and they're like, the planet's going to die. And you know, you got the, in London, there's been protests this week, and you got these young kids out there. A lot of teenagers are very wrapped up in this, and they say, why does anything matter if, if in 10 years we're all going to die? And there are literally people saying this stuff uh, when, when I think that that's – as far-fetched as anything can get, that in, in, in 10 years or even in anybody's lifetime, that th these kids are going to be dead as a result of, of fossil fuel additions to climate change. And I think that a couple of things are uh, the, the most important moving forward. Number one, I think we need to teach people that climate change is real. Humans and their interactions with Earth have made climate change a much more dire issue, and it's something that needs to be addressed. However, the planet doesn't give a good goddamn what's happening with all this. The planet is just a ball, you know, a rock floating around the, the, the solar system. It, it'll, it'll live on far beyond us no matter what we do here. But more importantly, these little kids, I don't think, should be in some ways brainwashed to think that the world is burning and that there is no hope here because I see so much of that. I see so much of that happening, and I think that's a little discouraging to see, I think that moving forward with all these stunning technological innovations that we've seen and advancements and a collection of data that is, is just at an extraordinary rate, we're getting data on everything you can think of. I think collecting more of that data vis-a-vis -vis issues with our climate, temperature and different things, you know, ice, uh, you know, the levels of ice in Antarctica and, and, and other places where we can watch this, gather so much more data, and then watch the technological innovations help us out of the future, assure that it's not going to be what some of these people think. Uh, I think that this is not only a doable and fixable problem, but I think we're going to do it and fix it. And when you see that this gets sort of radicalized on either side, one side being that, no, there's nothing wrong with the climate, this, this is the way it is, and the other side being the world is burning, that creates a struggle that makes any progress hard on this. So let me give you some data points, um, several data points that frame, should frame this for you and for your listeners. First of all, what is happening now with this planet has not happened since Homo sapiens have been on it. So there is no map that we can go back to. There is no manual. Mm -hmm. There isn't even in our DNA. So in the early stages of this, where climate change was being talked about aggressively in the 80s, was, well, um, the scientists may be right, the scientists may be wrong, the climate change denier may be right, may be wrong, and there isn't substantial evidence, right? So, so that's one thing. What's happening has never happened before since we've been on this planet. Second thing is to your point about the planet. I'm so glad you say that I get up and stay. I just did a TED talk on this topic. And I said, I said, uh, you know, save the planet. I said, save the planet shows you're ignorant about climate change. And people kind of look up and I kind of go, you know, hail here, sign this petition and help us save the planet. <laughs> it shows idiocy, lunacy, just like in all the hotel rooms I stay in saying, help us save the planet by not making us wash your towels, right? Uh, Which is green, man. So, so the, the, the simple thing, the simple, the simplest this is to way save, to think, this, this is to save us, not the planet. Right. You got that right from having read the book. In other words, say the planet has been here for 3.5 billion years and it's estimated to be here for three to 4 billion years until the sun blows up. So the planet is going to be fine. 
it's we have to save ourselves from ourselves. The planet does it, the planet is reacting to our behavior on the planet. Mm-hmm. The planet's not dying. In other words, this is a sixth, six, one, two, three, four, five, sixth extinction event. It's the first one created by a single species, us. In the last five extinction events, there's been anywhere from low 70% to high 90% total wiping out of the existing species. And then the earth, you know, biology and evolution took root, right? So the dinosaurs were here, they're gone. And we may be here and we may be gone. Yeah. So the issue isn't about saving the planet. Whenever somebody says that, it, it's kind of the vernacular. But anybody who has any intelligence, we're not saving the planet. We've, we're trying to save ourselves from ourselves. <laughs> and, yeah. that, and, 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 and this whole radical thing that, is, that you know, concerns me, the way to think about it is it's in a reaction to the deniers. It's in reaction to ExxonMobil sure. knowing for decades. So, so there's, and, and both, an, and there's, both, a, there's, and there's both, a valid anger there. Sorry. And, and both sides sort of probably push each other further and further into exactly. those directions. Yeah. Exactly. And that, and you know, that's what I said, politics gets in the way of human evolution. And, and, you know, it's just like, I don't understand why, why senators and politicians have a right to weigh in on what they don't know about, which is climate change. And I don't know why senators and politicians don't have a way to weigh in on, have a right to weigh in on healthcare. Did you get an MD? Well, then shut up, right? (laughs) Did you get a degree? Then shut up or the same thing. Oh, you know, all these people running for president, right? Or, through our whole lifetime. Well, here's what we should do economically. I'm sorry, did you get an economics degree? I mean, so the point is everything gets politicized. And once it does it, as I keep saying, it slows down human evolution. Yeah. So, so I really, um, we are at a critical time though. So. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not, you know, again, at the top of the hour, we talked about forecasts. My sole function as a futurist is to be right about the future. And if I am not doing that, then I'm not doing my duty. So relative to climate change, it's not that I'm a, a hug tree person or a climate change scientist. I'm just a futurist who sees clearly and has done the evidence and has been through it. I, I was at the first Earth Day. I mean, I go way back. I'm the futurist huh. known for this. And and the point is that is that is that is that um, as a futurist, the, the, the book you referred to that we'll talk about in a minute, I, as I write it. My reaction is I know that this is going to be right. And whether it whether I, I break through and can help my there's two strong emotions I have in writing this trilogy of ebooks. One is I know what I'm saying is correct. And five, ten years from now will be looked back on as either the roadmap that we gladly followed or what we should have done. The second thing is that is that um, I want I'm so concerned about it that, you know, it's such a big problem. What can I do? Well, I have a platform and I'm a futurist and I've got a reputation and I've got a reputation for accuracy. So maybe me weighing in is this is this, this trilogy is like the last thing I'm going to do on it. I'm going to give it all I can and try to make it work. And I'm so happy that you're interviewing me. I want to get the platform to get people to understand this. And then that's all I can do yeah. unless, you know, literally hundreds of millions of other people join in. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I want to ask you this question carefully okay. because I'm, I'm not implying anything in the slightest, but I, I think it's a really interesting question. And so I'm going to toss it by you. So don't think that this is related to anything hey. that I've heard you say or anything I've seen you write, but every person on the planet, as you and I well know, has their own personal biases, you know, and right. you have things that can uh, can throw off your perception of things. How, as a futurist, do you work around that? So, great question. I started in my career as a speaker, I always have Q&A. And early on, I started getting questions that were asked like, well, I don't know that you're right about that because of, and I hear a point of view. So now I incorporate it into my presentation because so many people... Hundreds of people come up and go, you know, that comment you made about points of view, that's my biggest takeaway. So here's what that is. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's constant in the universe is change. Okay. So the minute you have a point of view, what you're doing is you're not, it's a filter on seeing the world. 
if you're a black man in the United States, you see the world differently than if you're a white man. If you're a Republican, you see the world differently if you're a Democrat. You live in Orlando, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. So the Orlando sports team, if you're if you're a fan, that's how you see it is through being an Orlando sports fan. And so what I try to so what I try to say to what I try to do to myself is whenever I get like on a pedestal or on a soapbox, like I am, you hear me now about climate change. I've gone back and checked. Do I have a point of view that's locking me in? Am I am I not, am I missing something? Right. And and like I asked my stepson, who's the smartest guy I know in sports, he's 25. I go, Jordan, why is it that when I talk to you about sports, you're always right? And he said, because I'm not a fan. Huh. I just look at sports. Right. Right. And, and, you know, like if you're a baseball fan, you, you got a great team. It wins 60 percent of the time. So 40 percent of the time you're going to be disappointed. So why even be there? Right. But the point of view I'm trying to say is a point of view is a point of view. So so how it, if you're a climate change denier, that's how you see it. If you're a climate change activist, that's how you look at the world. You so, can't look at Exxon Mobil and see anything but bad. Right. And and the point I say, if the world is constantly changing and you're holding on to a fixed position, what have you missed in the last minute to 10 years? You've missed something. You know, it's like that person who says, I need everybody coming into work so I can see that they're working. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that's an interesting element of things like you. you, it, it seems like an intellectual exercise that is just kind of built into what you're doing that you have to go. Okay, let me make sure that uh, let me back up and, and take a look at how I've seen this, and is there another way to see this, and am I seeing it the accurate way? And uh, it just like that's a deep inside your mind argument that goes through the right. process here. The, the the single thing I would say, as I said to the audience to your listeners, is if you have a point of view that I am a, mm -hmm. you know, and you you dig your plant your flag in the ground on some it. sort of team. Right. All I ask is that from time to time you introspect as to how much that is of you that you're willing to let it filter incoming data. And if, you know, if you choose a point of view after you have, after you have done a self analysis and go, yeah, I think that's right. And I think that's who I am. And that's things I, who I want to be. And that's how I want to show up in the world. That's okay. But if you're not conscious, in other words, like all these stupid people who are appropriating the phrase that you so clearly shot down, save the planet because they've appropriated it. Mm -hmm. Right. They haven't thought about it, yeah. you know, and you know, and we can go on for hours about thinking and not thinking and the blind leading the blind. But the point is, if you have a point of view, from time to time, just stop and go, am I really so strongly a Republican I can't listen to a Democrat? I mean, look what's happened in our country today, right? I mean, that's like everyone is locked into their points of view. Yeah. That's why nothing happens. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the problem, the gridlock that we get to, like intellectual gridlock, where we, we, just, exactly. where we speak past each other and we, we go nowhere. Uh, as, as you could tell, I could talk to David Hool for uh, days and days and days. I could talk to you, Sean, for days. You're great. You're, you're one of the smarter media people I've had interviews with, and I mean that sincerely. I mean, well, we've been talking for an hour and a half. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that, number one. But now I know that there's going to be people who go, this just fired up my brain. I, I want to go deeper. I want to I want to learn more. So um, uh, let, let's start with the, the books that you have on, on Amazon that people could get a hold of and then end things up with sure. uh, with moving to a finite earth economy. OK, great. So so um, what 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 can people find if they want to dive a bit deeper into what you've uh, what well, you've written? You know, all, first of all, all my books are on Amazon and you just need to type in. David Huell books. I have an author's page. You can find your way to get that. If you, if I'll, you, I'll link you, that too. Okay, great. And, and if somebody wants to dive into the big concepts that you and I've been touching on, the best book would be a book that came out that I wrote in 2012 called entering the shift age, which is a follow up to my first book, which was my breakout book called the shift age. But to me, that's out of date because it's 13 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Entering the Shift Age, and then I, I wrote Shift Ed, Transforming K-12 through Education, if you're interested in that. I wrote The New Health Age, The Future of Healthcare in America, if you're interested in that. I wrote uh, a, a mini ebook 
all my eBooks, if I control it, are two ninety nine. By the way, I think they should be cheap. Wow! And I, I wrote a book in twenty thirteen that now is getting a lot of resonance called "Is Privacy Dead: The Future of Privacy in the Digital Age." I wrote a book on brand, brand shift, the future brands and marketing. And I wrote that at kind of the high end. So if anybody listening is in marketing, it's targeted for you. Mm-hmm. And the, sh- the, the this spaceship Earth, short book, 110 pages. I'm not going to write a book any longer than that. And people have told me it's the first time that they've read a book and they totally understand climate change because it has enough science, but it's simply written. It's not like beating you over the head as, with a scientist, right? I mean, think about who you've heard of climate change from. The, the quote, as a young man, I read Marshall McLuhan, R. Buckminster Fuller, and Dr. Alvin Toffler, plus a lot of science fiction. And Marshall McLuhan, the great futurist on media, said around Earth Day, 1970, he said, there are no passengers on spaceship Earth. We are all crew. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the fundamental truth that a sp- Earth is a spaceship. Like a spaceship, it's not getting resupplied from anywhere. So we're in this little tiny orb That's in the great. middle of, of endless space, and we're not getting resupplied. So um, as so, I'm sorry, you wanted my books. And, then the, and so those are the books from the past. Simply put, environment, the spaceship Earth, big concept, entering the shift age, and then all the others are somewhat relative to specific categories. I, I love that quote. I think that really sends your brain down a path there if you start to think about the planet well, that way. And yeah, it, it, I set up a non The two years it took to write that book, because I was writing it with a professor and he was busy and I was busy, I realized that I had to do something. So as soon as that book came out, I set up a global nonprofit based here in Sarasota, Florida called thisspaceshipearth.org to create crew consciousness on the planet, mm-hmm. because that's one of the three legs, as, as you know, from having read the first part of the trilogy that we have to use. You know, when I say crew, like, for example, people say, what does that mean? So let me ask you a question and then your listeners can think if they know the answer. So, Sean, how much do you pay a month for electricity? Oh, uh, the ballpark. About $300. Really? Okay. So you got a big house or you have a heated pool or something. Right. Um, and how much energy are you paying for? Oh, God. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things where you go, I, I don't know how many kilowatts per hour. I always just look for the money on that thing. Right. Exactly. Uh-huh. So here's So you have come to getting your bill monthly as a price condition consumer. Uh-huh. If it's 300, I'll pay it. If it's 400, wait a minute, what happened? Oh yeah, right, it's 100 degrees for 10 days or whatever it is, right? Thinking is true is, as, as I like to say, the 2% solution. So the average American pays, has about 1,000 kilowatt hours uh, that they use. You're, you're probably at about two to 3,000 kilowatt hours uh, based on your cost. Um, so, so 1,000 kilowatt hours, $100. Okay, so cut it by two percent. So next month you're using eight. You're using nine hundred and eighty yeah. kilowatt hours, and then nine sixty. After six months, you're down to eight eighty. Well, you'll be paying a lot less, but you're also controlling what you use, which is being responsible as a crew member. Yeah, because you know, so so it's that type of thing. And you know what? You, you know, know what's, you know what's really interesting, David is, um, and I know this is part of a larger theme, like being a crew member, and we're all kind of together in this. But just on that smaller note, uh, I've been looking into the Tesla Powerwall technology, and I find that really interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it's you know renewable energy, and 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 uh, it's an interesting idea, and there's some uh, self sufficiency attached to it, especially if, as that technology evolves. But the most important thing that I saw from it was when you see people who start to look at everything in their house and what kind of power it draws. And they stop thinking about things in terms of those dollar signs so much and more, hey, I only have this much power to use in my battery. What is wasting power? And all of a sudden, it almost gamifies power. Totally, totally. I mean, that's that's really well said. It gamifies power. Like, like for example, did you know that you know, we leave, you know, I, I, my wife and I have iPhones and I have a Mac. We have all these white cords that are plugged in, you know, th- things that are always on ready for when you need them use up 10% of your energy, right? So if you left at home and you, un- every morning, if you left home or you went away on vacation, you unplugged all your things, 
you would save 10 to 15% of your energy because they're always on waiting for you, yeah. right? I mean, it's all been conditioned for us to spend ever more money in electricity. Yeah, yeah, and then you have the power companies. They almost pretend like they want to give you access to this information, but that's not in their best interest. It's <laughs> they, not, <laughs> it's not. So, I mean, so the point, coming back to it, so crew consciousness is, is what the nonprofit's about, what that book is about, because there are no passengers in Spaceship Earth. And the other quote, that made me title that book that way comes from, again, one of my heroes, our Buckminster Fuller, the guy who created the geodesic dome. I mean, you go down and look at, go down and look at Epcot, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that comes from him. And, and, and he's, he said in 1969 in a book called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, he said, we live on a spaceship and we haven't developed an operating manual for spaceship and we have to use systems thinking to develop an operating manual. We need to do it in the next few decades. Then immediately later, he came out with a book called Utopia Oblivion, where he said, if we don't develop an operating manual for, for Spaceship Earth, we might not. If we do, we can go to Utopia. If we don't, it'll be um, uh, uh, Oblivion. Mm -hmm. And I, this futurist happens to think we're at that fork in the road that he wrote about 40 year, 50 years ago, that we're at that fork in the road. So... Um, yeah, You know, that, that, that's why crew consciousness is important. So we think about it. I mean, you know, I get my garbage picked up Tuesday morning in my development, right? They pick up the garbage and the recycling. Oh, my garbage is gone. Well, it hasn't left the spaceship. It's just been moved <laughs> to some other place. It sure right? seems like it has, though. It's not there right. anymore. It's not there, but <laughs> it's someplace else, right? Yeah. You know? So my garbage is not with me anymore, but somebody else has my garbage. And what are they doing with it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, uh, that, that stuff sends you into a whole nother realm of thought that it's very easy to detach yourself from. And that's, that's why I think a lot of the ideas in this moving to a finite earth economy are, are super interesting. And, and I like how you, you know, you're not trying to uh, write something that is 800 pages long. You're trying to, you're taking the best information and distilling it down into something that's super readable but full of all the best stuff, like all, all killer, no filler. If it were a, uh, you know, no, I like that phrase you know, slogan yeah. on a, on a classic well, rock station. You know, it's got all the stuff you want and nothing to just buttress it up and uh, messy up the arguments. So I, I thought it was really interesting moving to a finite earth economy. I hope people check it out. When did, when did the other ones in the series come out? Well, the, the first one is up now, as you said, finite, moving to a finite earth economy, crew manual, the three economies. So that sets up the three economies, what we lived in a growth economy, what we tried and failed to do, which is a circular economy coming out of Earth Day, and what we need to do is a finite earth economy, which starts with the fact that we have finite resources on Earth. Book two is the new technologies and the new metrics. And book three is global to, to personal, meaning, so book two is about um, all the new technologies we need to do. We need to move away from GDP and come up with other metrics, and I'm suggesting. And then book three, at the global level, what do we humanity need to do? At the nation state level, what do we need to do? At the state level, what do we need to do? At, at, the, at the city, neighborhood, and personal level, what we need to do. So my job is to answer the question, what do we need to do to face climate change? And the, the rebel in me gets a delight out of writing this, Sean, because I'm going after um, the people who think they know but don't know, like almost anybody you hear on media, yeah. you know, and challenging. Well, here's what we need to do. Well, I don't know if we can do that. Well, it's either doing it by 2030 or no civilization by 2100. That's the stakes you have to choose. So I'm going after the ignorant. I'm also going after these, and I can't say it without probably angering somebody, <laughs> these kind of self-righteous greenies that I know too many, you know, they get in their SUV to drive to demonstrate for climate change, or they busy show up and they go, here's how green we are. We've got a hybrid and we compost. And I go, are you ready to step by and close for a few years? Yeah. Are you ready to bump up downsize? Are you ready? You know, so it's across the board. I'm making everybody who says they want to change understand how difficult it's going to change and what they have to do. They can't just complain about the way it is. And I want people who 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 don't think we have to change the risks of holding on to that position. Do you have audiobooks of any of these? 
I will as soon as I get this. Uh, I'm going to, the second book. It, sorry to answer, not delay answer your question. First book went up three weeks ago. Next book is going up hopefully in three weeks, and then the third book four weeks after that. So book one end of March, book two early to mid May, book three early to mid June, and in June I'm going to do audiobooks for all three. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I mean yeah. That's, that's just such for content like this. It's such a great way it's people easy. grab it on and, the drive. And and the one thing I do want to say that you've noticed is these books. Think of any climate change book you read or any non nonfiction book. They have all this stuff in it that you got to wade through, right? So the book, the text, as you saw, each one is like seven chapters, and it's like seventy five pages each. And here's everything you need to know to get the high view to change your thinking. If because they're eBooks, I've got hyperlinks, and in addition to the footnotes. In the first book, in the second and third, we're going to put an addendum. If you want to do a deep drive into space, solar power, if you want to do a deep drive into whatever it is, you can go to these links. So I say to people, you can read the book in an hour, and if you want to get educated, you can spend hours on all the links we've provided of all the source material. So I've, I've bifurcated what most people feel they have to read linearly in a book, which is, oh, i got to wade through all this stuff. Tell me what the bottom line is. That's why summaries of books are so popular these days in a in an attention span in shortest attention span theater mm -hmm. where we live you've, you've you've got to make it simple straight and short and easy to read and let people go deeper if they want to unlike normal academic tomes which is you got to wade through all this stuff that's really impenetrable, so I'm not going to finish the book. Yeah, well, I mean, it's all incredibly interesting. I, I I want people who I I know who listen to this show who are intellectually curious to dive down deep into that and just soak it all up uh, because you you've done the the groundwork there, and there's some really interesting um, land to explore. So thank you, David uh, Hull. Thank you for for taking the time. Uh, for talking to us, and uh, really, really interesting discussion. Go to davidhool.com. That's david, H-O-U-L-E.com. Check out all his books on Amazon. We'll put those links up all over the place. And, again, thanks for, uh, thanks for the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the intelligence of the conversation. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to the second episode of the News Junkie interviews. Again, thanks for all the feedback. If there's anything you'd like to hear, uh, questions that you think should be addressed, uh, interviews that you would like to hear featured uh, on the News Junkie interviews, let me know. Tips at thenewsjunkie.com. And we'll see you very soon with a brand new episode of the News Junkie interviews. Listen or subscribe now. Search for the or on the podcast app of your choice.